All right. <clears throat> Man, I got a little bit of a scratchy, scratchiness going on this morning. <clears throat> Man, I'm going to need some of that water today. Quite. Uh, I got one, Katie. Yeah, I got one. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, so a couple weeks back, we were talking about the church on our 12-year anniversary, and uh, we read a scripture um, about the prophets, apostles, and stuff like that, and I had been telling you that I'm going to get back at that last week. I didn't have the time to kind of follow up on that. Uh, but this week we are. We're going to talk in Ephesians, and um, the subject this morning is called a healthy church, or actually a healthy body, I should say. In the in Scripture, the the church is referred to the body of Christ, and and so today's topic is called a healthy body. First, I just want to kind of bring out a question: Has anybody ever gone on like a diet program before to try to to try to you know do some stuff with your weight or whatever? Yeah. No, no. Have you ever just, okay, maybe you've never gone on a program that may have been a little specific. Have you ever done anything to try to, any kind of discipline to try to help uh, in a certain way, form or fashion, way, the way you eat, the way you exercise, or so on? Okay. I think that's more broad, and I think a lot of people have done that. We've, we've um, adopted some type of discipline in our life, whether it be eating correctly or, like I said, exercise or so on. Uh, I remember in my 20s when I was, and you know, I've never truly been like really overweight. I th- there was one time where I was 225, man, and I just remember, <laughs> and I, I've told this before, but I remember coming home one day and sitting on the bed, uh, you know, like, and Melanie was asleep, and I sat on the bed, and I kind of looked at my belly, man, and there was like three rolls, like one, two, and three, and I was like, and then I t- bent down and tried to tie, like, untie my shoe and everything, and that was, that was the time where I looked at myself in the mirror and said, this is going to change tonight, and the very next day, I started a regiment, started working out, and started practicing uh, healthier eatings. And one of the things that I learned was portions are a big part of that. Um, a lot of us sit down to large portions. And, and, and I've been told before, I'm getting a little off topic, but I've been told before that your metabolism is like a fire, okay, in weight losing uh, uh, advice this morning that your metabolism is like a fire and if you if you eat larger portions it's like throwing a lot of wood on the fire doesn't mean it'll stop burning but you kind of stifle the fire the goal is to have propor- uh, have portions to where you kindle that fire and if you do it right that fire will will actually grow and you'll have more energy and so on and so uh, back in my 20s I, I don't know if you remember this or not there was a a pill that could be bought almost everywhere called Metabolife 365. Y'all remember that? Man, it was very, very, very popular. It was called Metabolite 365. And I think it had a form of ephedrine in it, which gave you energy and everything. And, and I was, you know, trying to lose weight in my 20s. And I'll never forget, I was taking like that once or twice a day. I wouldn't have ever you know, told anybody to do that looking in hindsight now. But as I was working out in the sun and everything, I'll never forget the day that that caught up with me. And I did not eat that day. Instead, I had taken, you know, a pill or two in the morning. I had so much energy and I was like running around. And then the next thing you know, sometime around four o'clock in the evening, man, I just came, I I had a headache and I just threw up everywhere. And it was mostly because... I didn't feed my body correctly, and my, my body was reacting to a chemical imbalance that wasn't balanced out by a food proportion, and so it had a negative effect on it. And that is a lot of times what happens with our bodies, the way that we treat them and so on. But it also can happen to the body of Christ as well. Okay, and so today, as we get into the message, one of the things that is going to stand out, that I at least want to stand out, is 
is how I want you to think of the body as a whole, and then I want you to think of us as individuals in this body and how we are to not only treat each other, but how we are to grow inside of the body. And so let's dive into it. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13 today. Ephesians 4, 1 through 13. Paul is addressing the church at Ephesus, and um, he's already um, in, in chapter 3 encouraged them about the love that is with Christ and how nothing can separate them from that. And now we get into chapter 4 as he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the, can you say that word? Calling. Everybody say it one more time. Calling. To live a life worthy of the calling, not a calling, it says, to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, okay? Um, I always knew growing up when I was in trouble, okay? And maybe you can attest to this, but if mom and dad ever said, Stephen, you know, it gave me permission to ignore them a little bit. If they said, Stephen Edward... All right, it was business. All right, Edward, if you don't know, is my middle name, and it was often used when they meant business, okay? <laughs> and they attached that to my first name, and, it, and, and when they called me by Stephen Edward, I listened, or I knew that there were consequences, okay? And so um, this word calling here, um, a lot of times it gets used in different ways in the church. And so I want to break down the three levels of calling today, if I can. Um, and you'll see this, um, like for instance, I know um, in the church there are people that will, be, that will use the, you know, the, that, this calling here as to say they have been called like me, like I've been called to be a pastor, okay? Or uh, like Chaz will use it. This is, he's do, he says before he's doing his calling up here. And that is appropriate. Uh, I want to share with you like the three levels of calling, okay? So if you look up this word in the Greek, it basically says this, uh, to be called. And it says uh, to call. Uh, the other one is to call by name. And the other one is to call... Uh, to bear a name or title, okay? To bear a name or title. So let me give you an example of how this translates into these three levels here, okay? So if I were to call, um, I'd be like calling and say, hey, come here. If I'm looking in a direction and I'm looking over here, it pops and I'm saying, hey, come here. I'm calling you. I'm telling you to come here, all right? That is a good way of saying you know, that it, there are certain times in your life where you may be going throughout your day or you may be, you know, over a span of a week or whatever, you may hear God saying, go over here, do this, um, take care of this. And there's a calling that is, he's calling you to do. He's calling you to take care of that. It's a calling. But then there's a, a, another level of that where, where I can say, Kevin, I would like for you to come here, to come here. And, and that's a different level of a calling. It's a calling by name. And it's like saying, hey, you know, Stephen, come over here. It's definitely a, another level. It is talking to somebody specifically about doing something specifically. But then there's a third level where if I say, like, Blaze, my son, come here. And then now you have the name attached to it, and now you have a title attached to the name and a specific calling. Okay, so if, if you look up this word, you will see that there, there are kind of those three levels of calling there. And, and so um, I, would, I would, you know, ask, just kind of present this to you in your own walk with Christ have you ever felt that before? Have you ever felt one of those levels of calling in your life where you felt like there was obviously something that was burning on your heart that you needed to do? Or maybe you felt like God has called you by name to do something specific? Or, or, or maybe you feel like that He's actually called you for a title or for a position 
in his body to do specifically. And so there are those three levels there. And so now as we get into it, um, and I do want to tell you that whenever it comes to this calling here, whenever he, he uses the word the calling, if we can go back to uh, verse 1, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Okay, the calling. I believe this is like the level two. Now, I might be wrong about this, but I believe this is the level two because I, I think that as you get into, you'll see in a little bit, as we get into the pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, and everything else, then there are titles that are attached to these callings where there are more specific, okay? However, whenever he, we all are encouraged to live a life worthy of the calling, that God has called you by name. He may have not have given you a title in the body yet, but he's called you by name, and he's called you into his body. So live a life worthy of being called into the body of Christ. So let's continue in verse 2. Um, be completely humble and gentle. Something that uh, I need some work on at times. Um, Melanie is good at this. She is, has the gift of mercy in her life, and it's obvious. Um, but oftentimes, I tend to be blunt in the way that I talk, and, uh, and then I realize as I go back that I could have softened that up a little bit, you know, if I'd have thought about it a little better. But uh, Scripture tells us, you know, that when, when we're, uh, we are to be humble and gentle and, gentle and patient, and I, I like this, not only general, but bearing with each other. Not just in general, but bearing with each other. Why did it say bearing? Do you know that there are people in the body that you just have to bear with? There are people in the church that, uh, yeah, they're not going anywhere. They're part of the body. And guess what? You just got to bear with them. And not only do you have to bear with them, but you are called to be humble and gentle and loving in bearing with them as well. So it's like a, you know, like a three thing on top of that. Bearing with each other in love. Now, look at verse 3. Uh, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In other words, make every effort to stay unified through the bond of peace. Um, a great example of this is, uh, is marriage. Because the truth is, is that I want you to know that in, in the body we all have Everybody has different backgrounds, man. If you, if you were just to spend a moment with some people and, and ask them about their history, you would be amazed about the way that they were brought up. Um, a couple of weeks back in our Tuesday night talk, man, I learned a lot about an individual that was brought up with an angry dad, man, and, and, and how it's affected his life. And the, 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 what we, you and I have gone through, man, in our experiences makes us unique. And it makes us unique in the way that we deal with each other. So we ought to go out of our way to not only just try to understand that, but to try to keep the unity in that. And a good example of this I use is when Melanie and I first got married, there was a lot of things, by the way, we just don't clap because it's over with. We just celebrated 19 years of marriage. But, when we, but at 19 years of marriage, we've understood what it takes to compromise with each other and to learn what we're both strong at and what we're both weak at. And one of the issues, just a window into our marriage, I grew up having to do the dishes when I was young, so I absolutely despise doing dishes. All right, despise them. I ref almost, I almost now do it occasionally. Will refuse to do dishes, and so Melanie and I have come up with an understanding in our marriage, and it's taken us a lot of time to kind of hone in on the, how we're going to do this. But I will cook a lot of times, but she will do the dishes, and a lot of times what, what happens is the dishes will start to pile up in the sink. And so one of the things that we do in bearing with each other in love and in gentleness and in humility, 
one of the things that we will do is compromise. I will cook and do everything else and I'll compromise when when the dishes get done sometimes they will pile up in both sinks and over the years we have understood that I like at least one sink to be empty so that I can fill up water or do whatever in it even if the dishes have to pile up on the side of a sink because there's too many already in one side of the sink and it's a level of compromise because we have learned to grow in unity look we we want to be together we love each other and we can't allow stupid dishes to bring a divorce in our family amongst other things okay because we've learned to live together in unity and that's what we have to do most of the time when it comes to dealing with people because look do you realize that underneath this roof we have republican and democrats Okay, we have strong values and strong views on a lot of different things. Okay, and we could focus on those things if we wanted to. We could talk about them and we could argue about them and everything else. But scripture says that we ought to go out of our way to find the thing that unites us. And the thing that unites us is the bond that we have with Christ Jesus and what he's done in our life. And, and it really irritates me whenever I, whenever I see somebody bringing that down and tearing that apart. Because as you'll see in a little bit, my role as pastor is to bring people together and to help shepherd people. And so anything that comes in that starts to tear people apart, that's when my bluntness will come out and my humility will go away, and my gentleness will fall by the wayside. But it's almost like a dad, in a way, that corrects. So, unity. Unity. Make every... My, I wrote it like this. I don't think it's highlighted on the screen, but we, we make every effort to treat each other respectfully because there is a bond that we understand unites us in Christ. Okay? So, let's move on. How are we united? So he didn't just say we ought to go out of our way to stay united. He, he says this, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope when you were called. Again, he's using the, the term called here. When God called you, he didn't call you under a different spirit, under a different name, under a different baptism, under different faith, it's, it's, it's one faith, one spirit, one body that you were called under. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You have the same spirit that I have in me, and that unites us. The spirit of God unites us because it is impossible for there to be a counter purpose. You, you, you realize that, that even though we may share uh, a different uh, political views, or, or we, may, we may disagree with, with our political views, or we may disagree with the way that we may go about doing things, that there is one thing that unites us, and that is that purpose. And that purpose that we share in Christ, it's impossible for it to fight itself. It can't fight itself. It's the same spirit. And so, in Christ, our goals and our motives and our desires are the same. There's a lot that we share that we have in common. The way we go about doing things may be different, but we share the same purpose. So let's continue. Because it's the same Spirit. Verse 7. But to each of us, I love this, but to each of us, we're going to spend some time on this, but to each one of us, grace, everybody say grace, has been given as Christ uh, apportioned it. This is why it says, and you'll see it's actually quoting Psalms 68, verse 18. If you want to write that down, I'll actually read it in a minute. But it's quoting now, Psalm 68, 18. When he ascended on high, he took many captives and he gave gifts to his people. It's a quote out of Psalm 68, 18, verse 9. What does... He ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one 
who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, to bring context to this, let's read this in, in Psalms 68, verses 17 through 18. It says, The chariots of God are, ten, are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. The Lord has come from Sinai into what? Into his sanctuary. Where in the Old Testament was his sanctuary? It was in the temple. Okay, that is an, an earthly dwelling place of God. Okay, so the, the chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands and thousands. The Lord has come into uh, has come from Sinai into his that Sinai is a mountain into his temp, into his sanctuary. When you ascended on high. You took many captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord, might dwell there. So it's, it's, it's bringing up a little bit of Old Testament here in the New Testament to make a tie that Christ was once dwelt in a temple, or the, the Spirit of God dwelt in a temple and lived in an earthly realm, and then ascended, and in the form of Christ came back to earth, and then dwelt in an earthly temple on earth through Jesus Christ, and then overcame death, and then ascended back to heaven. So, so Paul is, he, he's, he's trying to tie in here when it comes to the body and the gifts, that there is one thing that unites us, and it unites us is because God, because Christ came to this earth to defeat death, hell, and the grave and to then be ascended to the right hand of the Father and to overcome that. So it taken, it's taken an Old Testament temple version of this, turn it into a New Testament revelation on what Christ did and then challenging us for what he is about to, to show us how he took that idea of the temple and the idea of Christ on earth and when he left, he, dis, he just didn't leave and left us here all by herself. He left us with key positions to equip the body. So watch this as we continue. Um, and I think I got this highlighted. Um, the same spirit that was in the temple came to earth and now has been raised to life. So now let's look at verse 11. The work, um, the work doesn't stop. Now that everything has been done, the work on Jesus' side, the work doesn't stop. So look at verse 11. So Christ himself, now this is where we kind of pick up from a couple of weeks ago. Christ himself gave the apostles, everybody say apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Okay, I told you last week that this is called in the church the fivefold ministry. So so growing up, I heard this idea of the fivefold ministry taught many times. I, I didn't really understand it. Um, it was just kind of said and and as as I grew up I understood that these were specific roles that God gave in the church. And I, I even said this la yes last week that the church as a whole, when I, when I talk about the church as a whole, I'm talking about bigger than us here. I'm talking about the entire church over the span of the globe. The church as a whole um, is referred to as the body. And just like the human body, which is a great example, great metaphor that Paul used, just like the human body, it is very complicated in its own workings, okay? Um, a lot of times what we see is just a church from the outside. Just like whenever I look at you, I see your physical body. But on the inside of that body, duh, there are some just some amazing things taking place every day. Just the way that the food that you eat is uh, digested and everything. I mean, there are extreme parts of the body that are at work every single day that I don't ever get to witness. But I know they're working. I know they're working because you're still alive. And you know, the cool thing is when you look at some of the teaching on this, Paul even says the hidden parts of the body are sometimes the ones that are the most important parts. We give a lot of, we give a lot of uh, recognition to the parts that we see, like the hands and the head and the feet or whatever, 
But when it comes to the parts that are hidden, man, if you didn't have those parts, those are key in making sure that your body stays alive. And so, and so what Paul does is, it, like a, I used this example last week, like a specialist, if you were to, to have a problem with your eyes, uh, what is the specialist called? Optom- optometrist? You would go see an optometrist about your eyes. If you have a problem with your skin, you would go see a dermatologist. And, and so just as there are titles for, for uh, people that's, that, that are specific about certain parts of the body, God has also designated certain callings by title that he has given to work on specific parts of the church as a body as well and so we we read these as apostles as prophets as evangelists as pastors and as teachers so what do they mean well i'm going to break these down in a a definition according to the way that the 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 original text was written apostle you'll see these come up is a delegate a messenger one sent forth with others okay paul is your greatest greatest example. He was the Apostle Paul. And he traveled and went all over with with his uh, compadres uh, like Timothy and and Barnabas and so on and started churches and and not only started churches but but taught in those churches and built the they they like a traveling messenger that helps build the church. Uh, prophet, which is probably one of the most complicated one because we see this one way more active in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that it's not, they're not active today or even in the New Testament, but we see these more active. It is one who is moved by the Spirit of God and, hen- and hence his organ or spokesman uh, solemnly declares to men what he is received by inspiration, especially concerning future events, and in particular, such as relate to the cause of kingdom of God and to human salvation. Okay, so we will see at work in the body. There's a guy named Perry Stone. Anybody heard of him before? All right, he has. Uh, there's also a guy. Um, God, what's the guy that always teaches on the end times? Hagee, Hagee and everything else. These guys, you can see that they, they, they operate a lot in this, this, uh, this calling here because they, and sometimes, by the way, um, they get it wrong. All right, listen, I've had experience with people, especially throughout our old church, our, our previous church, that called themselves prophets and and basically what they were were performers instead of prophets all right they showed up at a church and they were to prophesy over people and in doing so they basically were supposed to have a prophecy for every individual that came to them i remember standing in a line of people waiting to be prophesied over and having an individual called a prophet or a prophetess, you know, lay their hand over me and tell me that you're, I, I remember one prophecy that I will go forth like Elijah who was caught up in a whirlwind. I'm like, that's kind of creepy actually, you know. You know what happened to Elijah? Like, homeboy was taken up, man. I don't, I don't know, I mean... I guess that's kind of comforting if I don't have to die on earth, I'm going to be taken up. But you realize there was only two people ever in the Bible that were account- that were that left this earth that didn't die. So I know I don't fit into that category because right? I know myself, right? But, but that's, so when it comes to this calling, I just want to say that, that oftentimes we see this used wrongly in, in the church. Although I don't want to diminish this calling because there are obvious reasons and ways that that people that have been given this gift have used it correctly and they have said things that have come to pass and they have to and you'll see a great examples of this is the way that prophets operate in the old testament but i also want you to realize in teaching of this i told you we we're going to spend some time on this so please just stay with me 
Also, we see in the New Testament that Paul specifically tells us that when it comes to the gift of prophecy, that we are to, uh, to seek after that gift above other gifts, um, like when it comes to tongues and so on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, it, it, Paul is talking about that. That is because whenever the prophets of the Old Testament would use their gift, most of the times they would boldly pro- proclaim what God said in the, in the presence of kings, okay? So I, I want you to get this. It's, it's a little bit more teaching today. But what prophets did was they would be before kings and they would boldly proclaim what, what was inspired upon them, what God told them to say to kings. And most of the time, it was what God said, but some of the times it was a future event that they were told to either not go off to war or that they would be blessed to go off to war. And so on and so on. To evade a land, to not invade a land. To do this, to do this. Uh, to, to, uh, the way that they operated with a certain person, the way that they didn't operate with a certain person. This is the way that the prophets operated in the Old Testament. And, and in saying that, that's one of the reasons why Paul challenged us to seek after this gift. Because one of the things that is the most powerful things that we could do is to understand what God's Word says and through inspiration, declare that to other people. And in doing so, you're operating in the gift of prophecy. And so you see this other thing happen. Now, another one is evangelist. Uh, Evangelist is a bringer of good tidings. You'll see that uh, we don't have many evangelists that come through our church. Uh, like I said, growing up, I, I and mostly it's because I'm just not in those circles. You know, it's it's kind of strange. Uh, um, you know, my week is spent, you know, as a legal drug dealer um, distributing caffeine to the stores. You know, um, I'm a coffee distributor, and so I don't really have the time to be in the circles of a lot of religious things. It, it, it just it's don't come it is, I don't have it and so uh, you'll see this a lot in other churches there'll be a special speaker that will come through that is an evangelist and most of the time a, an evangelist will carry this message but you'll see that most of the time this this message is encouraging to the body and it lifts up and encourages the body and it's weird because i always wondered why it took an evangelist to come to the church to get certain people saved because it was weird growing up I, you know the pastor would 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 preach on sunday and to me it would be a good message and he would give an altar call and there would be four or five group of people but when an evangelist came my god man the whole church came forward and it was like because it was an encouragement to the entire body and it encouraged the body you'll see that the evangelist is a bringer of good tidings the name given to a new testament heralds which is basically a a person that brings news a, a new testament heralds of salvation through christ who is not an apostle they have a different role in the church so let's continue now uh the pastor a pastor is a herdsman need to take a drink How are we looking on time? Ah, who cares? <laughs> a, a, a pastor is a herdsman, is, is a shepherd, okay? It, it, he who care who, who he to whose whom cares and controls others and man, I just botched that. He to whose care and control others have committed themselves and to whose precepts they follow. Okay, so you see a different role now in the pastor, and most of the time, you'll see that a pastor has uh, unique gifts to to bring people together and to care for people and to and to diffuse uh, certain situations to try to bring people together. And you'll see that there are certain precepts like. Uh, One of my biggest things that you'll see that is all throughout my messages, most of my messages, is is that as 
people of, of, as followers of Christ and as believers, one of the major things that we should do is to try the best that we can to take on the character of Christ. That is a, a precept of mine. It is one of the things that is through all, almost all of my messages is to challenge you in your, in your, not just in your beliefs, but in the way that you live your life to try to become more and more Christ-like. Uh, okay, so then we get into teachers. And teachers are ones, uh, one who teaches uh, concerning the things of God and the duties of man. So that's pretty obvious, but they have a, a unique gifting to bring understanding uh, of the way that things are, are broke down. Pastors oftentimes have a part of that gift. And all these gifts, they, they, they work in a certain fashion, all right? I guess we ought to stand. Let's stand. It'll make me feel like that I don't want y'all to stand too long <laughs> as we close. So these, all these gifts that are given, all these callings that are, that are given specifically to, uh, by title to people in the body, uh, they work in harmony together to build up the body. And I want you to see this last final point here in verse 12. Um, well, let's go back to verse 11 and let's read it uh, together. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave, we don't not, not read it together, but Christ himself gave apostles, the prophets and the evangelists and pastors and teachers, and look at verse 12, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, until we all are able to get along with the thing that unites us, that binds us together, and which is our faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Because that's important. We have to be growing. If you're not growing, you're missing part of your part in the body. You have to grow. If there's, if, there's a, if there's a part of the body that is not growing with the rest of the body, there is a cancer in the body. Okay? So we have to be maturing. Attaining, I want, you to really, I want this really to stick to you, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now I want to read this to you in the King James Version because this is something that really stuck out to me. It is the word uh, differently. Um, the word attaining here is, is, is uh, substituted with the word stature in the King James Version. So let's read it, Ephesians 4.13 in the King James Version. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God until... Uh, unto a perfect man, until a perfect human, until the measure of the what? Of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Stature means importance or reputation gained by ability or achievement. And so I want you to know that when it comes to the way that the body is shaped and formed according to the, the purpose of Christ, that when Christ left this earth, He left, but He also, according to the Scripture, gave grace in the form of gifts to certain people. And He gave them in the form of, of titles so that the church could be built up for the works of service. You and I, uh, even though we may not have a calling as a title, as a pastor or evangelist or a teacher or a prophet or apostle, that there are works of service. There are other callings that you are to attend to. And they're, they're, that for, they're there for a reason. It's so that we all can grow in the stature of Christ. Do you see that it is the reputation gained by the ability by the ability of achievement? That there is a reputation. It's it's called maturity in the body, and, and it comes with 
not just, but it is important, doing what we're doing right now, coming together as a body, as a portion of the body, loving on each other, finding the things that we have in common, building each other up, encouraging each other, realizing that some of us had some really hard weeks and that we really need this right now, okay? We really need to be here with other believers that could encourage us, that could speak life in us, that could find the things that we have in common and build the unity up in this body because there's work to do. There's work to do. And all the titles that are given are given there to equip you guys to be able to do that effectively. Effectively. Through good teaching. Some of it may be through physical uh, equipping. There may be some resources that you need in order to do certain things. That's my role. To equip you to do works of service. So you see that inside the body there's just intricate parts that are working understanding this is part of that and you've been standing for long enough so let's pray the first thing i want to say is i want to make an offer to you guys if there's anybody here that hasn't made a, a decision to honestly surrender their life today i don't know where you stand i don't know where you've been but you may have doubted there are certain things that you may have doubted before and i when i look at certain people's stories i realize now more than ever that certain people come to god different ways with me it was a really hardcore giving up of my life in the past with other it's been through logical um it's been through logical definitions of things that they've come to christ over time maybe you maybe you got maybe you're here and you uh you haven't made that decision yet i I appeal to you this morning that god is drawing you if you've if you feel not just emotionally but through his presence that you feel a drawing today it says in scripture that no man can come to know christ unless they've been drawn by him So if you feel that drawing today, it's important that you make that decision. And lastly, where are you in the body? We learned a lot about the body today. What's your role in the body? Maybe you have a title. Maybe you just have some things that God is calling you to do. Just be obedient. I promise you that you will not regret it. So let's pray about that. Father, uh, we thank you this morning. And we realize that you're so big. You're so awesome. And and what an honor, God, that I have to stand... As a, as a pastor, as a teacher, before a group of people that probably have plans today and try to teach them just for a moment, just for 45 minutes of how they fit in to your purpose. And God, I just pray that they would realize that there is a, a serious part of this that comes along with understanding your word and then following it. In fact, Jesus used that example of a person that built their house on a rock. So I pray that when it comes to our life, we are people that have a foundation of hearing and obeying. Hearing and obeying. And yeah, the enemy comes in and tries to point out all of our downfalls and our failures and our sins and tell us how much of a bad person we are we have to learn to ignore that voice and instead listen to the voice of conviction and through that god i pray that you will speak to people specifically about what they are to do in your body Be specific to us, Father. It's what we pray. You're always specific. But I pray that you bring clarity on our part. 
so that when we pray, we get confirmation. And confirmation can come from prayer and understanding, but it can also come from people that confirm our gifts. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to work in your body. We love you with our whole hearts. Help us be obedient this morning. And thank you for your love, God, that goes beyond all understanding and brings peace that unites us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 So I was told the last couple of weeks were a short message, and that's what happens after the last couple of weeks. So... God bless you guys. Look, if you have any questions, if you need prayer or anything, we do have a staff around here. Um, and of course, I'm available. H have a great week. And I want you to meditate on this this week about your part in the body of Christ. And don't forget, Tuesday is God Talks here at 7. Come a little early and have some fellowship. So, yeah.